Hello friends, Steve Stockton here with you. Welcome to our latest video. Today, we're going to bring you six strange cases of people last seen running into the woods. Now, the missing person epidemic not only affects just the U.S., but the U.K. and many other parts of the world. Thankfully, most missing people are discovered alive and well, but some cases remain cold and unsolved, whether that be for a few years or even decades. So, take a walk with me now as we explore these six strange cases. Number six, Craig Freer. Craig Freer was your average 17-year-old. He was going into his senior year at high school and was the co-captain of the school's football team. Craig had also picked up a part-time job and was looking ahead to the future, and his future was bright. There were a few colleges interested in offering Craig a scholarship for his sporting abilities, and the world was truly his oyster. Unfortunately, any chance at a bright future was taken away from him one fateful day in June 2004. His sudden disappearance would turn the lives of his family upside down, and as recently as 2021, the New York State Police are still actively investigating and chasing down new leads. Craig's parents were happy when they heard he had picked up a part-time job at the Price Chopper supermarket in Glenville, New York. Craig picked up a few shifts, which somehow he managed to fit into his busy schedule. On Sunday, June 27, 2004, Craig walked out of his home for what would be the last time. As far as his parents were concerned, he was headed to work. His mother, Veronica, had seen him carrying his uniform with him to his car. But when Veronica arrived at the supermarket where Craig worked, just a few hours after he'd left for his shift, she was shocked to find no sign of him. She was even more shocked to learn that Craig hadn't been working at the supermarket for quite some time. Whether it was shame, embarrassment, or something else that made Craig hide the fact that he got sacked, we'll never know. His parents were, of course, very upset that Craig had lied to them, and they called Craig's girlfriend to see if she knew where he was. At first, she said she had no idea, but after a second call, she caved in and admitted that he was with her. Veronica gave Craig a stern talking to, telling him that he needed to come home right away and that they needed to have a chat, a sentence that every teenager dreads hearing. Craig said goodbye to his girlfriend and left her apartment located in Scotia, New York. According to his girlfriend, she watched as he walked towards his car, but then at the last minute, darted off in the opposite direction. What had scared Craig, and why had he run away from his car? Surely, if he was in danger, the best thing to do would be to head to the car and drive away or go back inside. According to reports, Craig ran into the nearby woods, and this is the last confirmed sighting of him. From here, all we have are alleged sightings and a few new pieces of evidence that may finally help us piece this puzzle together. When Craig failed to return home to have a chat with his parents, they waited and waited and waited. As the hours ticked by, it eventually dawned on them that something just wasn't right. Craig was in trouble, but it wasn't like him to run away and leave without telling his parents where he was going. Some people naturally lean towards the flight side of the fight or flight feeling, but his parents knew he would have to come home at some point. But that some point never came. And by 5 p.m. that day, Veronica had picked up the phone and reported her 17-year-old son missing. It appears that the investigators weren't all too interested at first, as is the case with most missing young people. After hearing about their disagreement earlier that day, they believed that Craig just wanted time to cool off and that he would eventually come back. Unfortunately, hours turned into days, and when the investigators found that he didn't have his phone or wallet with him at the time of his disappearance, they agreed that something was wrong and began to further investigate. Those investigators found that Craig had left his wallet and $40 behind at his house, something he would have needed if he planned on spending a few days away from his family. His driver's license was also missing. However, his parents explained that it had been lost before his disappearance, and he was in the process of getting a new one. So, without money, ID, or driver's license, it was clear that Craig wouldn't have gotten very far. All he had was his car, but that had been left abandoned in the parking lot of his girlfriend's apartment complex. So, where was he? Investigators hit a big lead when interviewing witnesses from that day. A group of teenagers came forward to tell the police that they had seen Craig 
or at least someone matching his description, walking along the railroad tracks behind his girlfriend's apartment complex shortly after he was seen entering the woods. It appears that they tried to engage him in conversation, but he motioned for them to be quiet and then just kept on walking. This event stuck in their mind due to the strange behavior and the bizarre nature of the incident, and it wasn't until news of his disappearance was made public that they connected the dots. Armed with this new lead, investigators began searching up and down the railway line behind Craig's girlfriend's apartment, but no sign of him was to be found. As the days pressed on and the investigation began to heat up, officers with dog units and ground teams were sent to the area where Craig was last seen. They also sent units to the Mohawk River, wondering whether he'd gotten injured and fallen in. But all of these searches turned up nothing. It seemed as if Craig had vanished into thin air, as if he were here at one moment and then gone the next. Craig's family and friends were all administered polygraph tests, and it appears that everyone passed, although, as we know, polygraph tests are a debatable technique in and of themselves and are not admissible in court in most countries. Hundreds of hours of interviews were conducted, but nothing ever came to fruition. How could a bright, promising 17-year-old just vanish into the woods? Searches continue for Craig and have done so over the years, although they have been majorly scaled back, of course. Craig's family are still desperately seeking answers, of course, and two years after he disappeared, the New York State Police became involved in his case. In 2021, a new lead was discovered and investigators hope this is the clue they need. One of Craig's co-workers at the Price Chopper supermarket told investigators that sometime between June 27th and July 2nd, 2004, he saw Craig in the passenger seat of a car traveling north on Route 50 in Glenville. According to this witness, the car stopped at the traffic lights on Sheffield Road before turning left, and that's when the witness lost sight of the car. This sighting has not been confirmed as of yet. However, it is the largest piece of information in regards to Craig's whereabouts that's turned up lately. Craig's parents have never given up and are hoping that one day they will learn the truth about what happened to their son. Craig Freer is described as a white male, red hair, brown eyes, 5 foot 11 inches tall and weighs approximately 190 pounds. He was last seen going into the woods behind the Cambridge Manor apartment complex in Scotia, New York on June 27, 2004. When last seen, he was wearing a white short sleeve t-shirt, blue jeans or jean shorts, white Adidas tennis shoes with three black stripes, and a gold chain with a St. Christopher medallion. Craig also had all four of his wisdom teeth removed in April 2004 and may wear his facial hair in a goatee. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the New York State Police at 518-630-1700. Number 5. Jeremy Alex 28-year-old Jeremy Alex was doing well for himself. He and his girlfriend were in the process of moving in together in Northport, Maine, and he was working as a self-employed landscape gardener in Lincolnville, Maine. When not at work, Jeremy enjoyed skateboarding and playing the guitar, and he spent much of his young adult life traveling around the U.S. and had even gotten involved with the organization Greenpeace at one point. By all accounts, Jeremy seemed like a fun-loving free spirit who was great to be around. In April 2004, Jeremy turned 28 years old and was at a key point in his life, as previously mentioned, he and his girlfriend were getting ready to move in together, and they were excited to start this new chapter in their lives. On April 23, 2004, Jeremy's parents drove from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, to his home in Lincolnville, Maine, to celebrate his 28th birthday that had just passed. They sat down for a meal, spoke about Jeremy's upcoming move, and talked about any possible plans he had for the future. Sadly, however, his parents' world would be turned upside down just 24 hours later. On April 24, 2004, the day after Jeremy's birthday dinner with his parents, Jeremy arrived at his girlfriend's house at around 11 a.m. to help her move. From the moment he arrived, she could tell that something was off. The once happy, smiling Jeremy had been replaced with a scared and paranoid person. Jeremy was very frustrated and blurted out to his girlfriend that, quote, bad people were after him. No amount of consoling or comforting could change Jeremy's mind, and he decided to leave instead of staying to help her move. 
This in itself was incredibly bizarre and very out of character, and the following events of that day would bring about even more questions. At around 5.20 p.m., a woman saw Jeremy running out of the woods and people noticed that Jeremy was clutching money in his hand. By the time the woman had gone inside to call the police, Jeremy had broken free from her husband's grip and took off running into the woods once more. Other witnesses reported seeing a man fitting Jeremy's description on Route 1, and after this, he has never been seen or heard from again. The police quickly arrived at the scene and took statements from the husband and wife duo. The next day, Jeremy's van was found abandoned near Pound Hill Road at the Waldo County Humane Society. Inside the van were his keys and phone, but sadly, no sign of Jeremy. Searches of the woods where Jeremy's car had been found were conducted, but no sign of him could be found there either. Investigators then began interviewing his girlfriend and found out that Jeremy may have fallen into old habits. Jeremy was in recovery from drug addiction, and according to his girlfriend, in recent months, he had unfortunately relapsed. Jeremy's girlfriend also stated that on the day he disappeared, he had been using illicit substances and that he had been experiencing these paranoid states for a while and that she and his friends were concerned for him. Was Jeremy's disappearance and his ramblings about the bad men substance-related psychosis or was someone really after him? In September of 2004, a full five months after Jeremy disappeared, a contractor in Jackson, Maine, reported seeing a man fitting Jeremy's description, again, coming out of the woods. According to this workman, the man he saw was acting erratically and strangely and couldn't seem to understand what was being said to him. Apparently, this kind stranger offered the man some food, but Jeremy, if it was Jeremy, refused. There was also another possible sighting in October 2004 where someone claimed to have seen Jeremy in the woods in Owl's Head, Maine. After that, Jeremy's case went cold for another four years, and then in April, his case took another bizarre turn. His driver's license was found to be in the possession of a couple living in Northport, Maine, the area that Jeremy was in the process of moving to with his girlfriend. According to this couple, they had begun building their house in May of 2004, and over the years, random items that belonged to Jeremy began washing up on the shore near their house. The couple held on to the driver's license and some money that washed ashore, and it wasn't until years later that they connected the dots to Jeremy's disappearance. What's even more bizarre is that their newly constructed home is connected to the woods that Jeremy was last seen running into. Did Jeremy fall off a cliff while running in the woods, or is there something more nefarious at play? His family believes that he likely met with foul play, although they did comment that he knew how to survive in the wilderness. Jeremy Alex was last seen on April 24, 2004, running into the woods in Northport, Maine. He is described as a white male with brown hair and brown eyes, stands about 5 foot 7 inches tall, and weighed approximately 150 pounds. Investigators have stated that Jeremy did indeed appear to be under the influence and confused at the time of his disappearance. Jeremy was known to smoke hand-rolled cigarettes and was last seen wearing an olive green flannel Timberland sweatshirt blue jeans or brown corduroy pants, tennis shoes, and carrying a red backpack. Anyone with any information regarding Jeremy's disappearance is urged to please contact the Maine State Police at 207-624-7076. Number 4. Willie Hodge Unfortunately, there's not a lot of information surrounding the disappearance of 39-year-old Willie Hodge in January of 2019 but here's what we do know. On January 23rd, 2019, Willie was last seen by his family as he was leaving his home in the 1100 block of Island Drive in Sumter County, South Carolina. According to the Charlie Project, Willie had an argument or altercation with his mother and left the house upset. This was the last time he was seen by his family. Police records indicate that later that evening, Willie was pulled over at the intersection of Pinewood Road and Columbia Circle during a traffic stop. WLTX News notes that Willie was pulled over for a traffic violation, but what the violation was has never been specified. The South Carolina Arrest Database does show that Willie has been arrested five times previously before his traffic stop in 2019, with offenses ranging from burglary, larceny, driving under suspension, to possession of narcotics and assault. These arrests may or may not be linked to his disappearance. However, 
it may explain what happened next. As the police pulled him over, Willie jumped out of his car and ran into the woods. Did Willie have a distrust of the police because of his previous charges, or was he scared of getting yet another charge? According to officers, they searched the immediate area for Willie, but there was no sign of him. As the days passed, his car remained abandoned, and they continued in their search for the missing man. Charles Bonner, a senior investigator with the Sumter County Sheriff's Office, told News 19 in February of 2019, we don't want to get him in trouble because of that. I just want to talk to him and make sure he's okay because he is a missing person. I take these very seriously, so I want to make sure that he's okay. There was also another person in the car with him that night he disappeared. However, this witness has been unable to provide any further information. Willie's mother, Sadie Hodge, told News 19, In my heart, I don't feel like he's alive anymore. It's just kind of a sense of peace that I have. In a way, it's a good thing, but I still hold out hope. I just want to know he's okay, whether it's here, whether he's found eternal peace. I just want to know he's okay. Willie Hodge was last seen running into the woods after being stopped by police at the intersection of Pinewood Road and Columbia Circle in Sumter County, South Carolina. Willie is described as a white male with brown hair and brown eyes, standing 5 foot 8 inches tall and weighs 140 pounds. Willie has the letters NTAB tattooed on his knuckles, street on the back of one arm, and dreams on the other. He also has a thug life tattooed across his stomach with the name Sadie over a heart and a tattoo of a woman on his calf. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the Sumter County Sheriff's Office at 803-436-2000 or Crime Stoppers at 1-888-CRIME-SC. Number three, Terrence Woods Jr. 26-year-old Terrence Woods Jr. was working as a TV production assistant for the UK production company Raw TV in conjunction with the Discovery Channel in 2018 and was out on location in Idaho. Unfortunately, one night while filming, Terrence ran off into the woods and hasn't been seen or heard from since. Terrence was working as part of a 12-person crew who were tasked with filming Gold Rush, Dave Turin's Lost Mine. Filming and production were going well with the crew, following Dave Turin around, seeing what he could dig up in the remote parts of the western United States. Then, on the evening of October 5th, 2018, everything changed. According to Vice, the crew had wrapped up filming for the day in Penman Mine near Oro Grande, Idaho County, when Terrence told two of the other crew members that he had to go and use the bathroom. Then, just seconds later, the associate producer, Simon G., who Terrence worked under, saw Terrence drop his radio and take off running into the trees. Terrence apparently ran down a steep cliff into a forest before disappearing into the thick woods. Those on set called out Terrence's name and desperately tried to catch up with him to see what was the matter, but the area he had apparently run into was rough and unpredictable, according to the crew. The crew spent some time searching for Terrence before realizing that they needed to call it in to the police. At 6.41 p.m., Terrence Woods Jr. was reported missing to the Idaho County Sheriff's Office. Somewhat disturbingly, the Sheriff's Office didn't arrive at the scene to begin the search for Terrence until the next morning. Their excuse was that the call was made at a late hour. This is just one of the disturbing facts surrounding Terrence's case. When the Idaho County Sheriff's Office finally arrived, they sent dog units, ATVs, helicopters, as well as boots on the ground to look for any sign of Terrence. The Idaho County Sheriff's Office found no sign of him, the dogs failed to pick up on any scent, and sadly, after six days, the search was called off. The Idaho County Sheriff's Office failed to act quickly in Terrence's disappearance, but they are not the only ones who acted strangely following his vanishing act. According to Valerie Woods, Terrence Jr.'s mother, the first thing Simon said on the phone, and when I met him in the police department, was, I had high expectations for your son. But when I met him, he didn't stand up to them. Vice ran an article in 2020 about Terrence's disappearance and the allegations of the toxic work culture at Raw TV and included an interesting detail. The article reads, quoting here, The original Idaho County Sheriff's Office report, seen by Vice, says that Terrence was having a really hard time emotionally and had a mental breakdown earlier today. 
When the 911 call was made, the caller, who was not part of the Raw TV crew, alleged that Terrence had been dealing with mental issues throughout the shoot. However, when pushed to confirm these statements by Terrence's family in the weeks following his disappearance, they were retracted, end quote. This article also includes information from Terrence's mother, Valerie. She says, he was responsible. He wouldn't run away without good reason unless he was scared. The article goes on to say, they believe Terrence felt intimidated or mistreated by his colleagues. They say that he wanted to return to his home in Maryland. An ex-Raw TV employee also told Vice, there was a laddie culture at the company. There was a toxic undercurrent, which made me feel very uncomfortable. There were conversations where they would make disparaging comments about people they were looking to hire. It made me feel quite uncomfortable. With all this information about Raw TV, it still remains to be seen whether they had anything to do with Terrence's disappearance. As of 2020, the Idaho County Sheriff's Office said that Terrence's case is still open, but not active, and that they are not actively searching for him. Terrence Woods Jr. was last seen running into the woods near Oro Grande in Idaho County, Idaho, on October 5, 2018, after telling two colleagues that he needed to use the bathroom. Terrence is described as an African-American male with black hair, brown eyes, 5 foot 9 inches tall, and 150 pounds. Terrence has a tattoo of a black oval on the inside of his left wrist and was last seen wearing a light brown jacket and black cargo pants. Anyone with any information is urged to please contact Lieutenant Jerry Johnson of the Idaho County Sheriff's Office at 208-983-1100 and reference case 181 Number 2. Lars Mittank The case of Lars Mittank is perhaps one of the most perplexing disappearances in recent true crime history, and while there are numerous theories surrounding his mysterious disappearance, we are still no closer to uncovering the truth of what happened in 2014. On June 30th of that year, 28-year-old Lars Mittank and a group of his friends traveled from their home in Germany to the Golden Sands Resort in Varna, Bulgaria. This was the perfect party destination for 28-year-old Lars and his friends, and parts of Bulgaria have picked up a reputation over the years for being party hotspots for young European tourists. The sun is blazing, drinks are cheap, and clubs are open all night long, making it the perfect place for young people to go and let their hair down, and that's exactly what Lars and his friends did. The first few days of the holiday went by without incident, with the group soaking up the sun and enjoying everything that the Golden Sands Resort had to offer. Then on July 6, just a day before they were due to head home, something strange happened. While out at a bar, Lars got into an argument with a rival football fan. Lars was a Werder Bremen fan, while the other person was a Bayern Munich fan. In Europe, they take football very seriously, and for some it's more of a religion than a sport, so it isn't surprising to hear that the argument became heated very quickly. The argument was dissipated after harsh words were thrown around, and Lars left the bar first without his friends. His friends figured that he was likely heading back to the hotel and that they would be able to catch up with him later. It wasn't until the next morning, however, that Lars returned to the hotel room with a ruptured eardrum and an injured jaw. According to reports, his friends gave investigators differing accounts of what had happened that night. Some of his friends said that after Lars left the bar, the men that he had been arguing with earlier jumped him, causing the injuries, while others claimed that the men in the bar had paid a local man to do their dirty work for them. Either way, Lars was left with a pretty serious injury that would kickstart a bizarre chain of events. His friends took him to see a doctor at the airport who confirmed that his eardrum had ruptured and they would not be able to fly until it was healed. Lars was given 500 milligrams of Cefprozil to help curb infection and was advised to remain in Bulgaria for a few days. His friends rallied around him, insisting that they would stay with him until he was cleared to fly. But oddly, Lars declined their offer. He insisted that he would be okay on his own, telling them to go ahead and fly back to Germany and that he would see them again very soon. There were no indications of what was to come and the events of the next few days would shock everyone. Lars checked himself into another hotel and remained there for just one night. Employees at the hotel reported he was acting very bizarrely and seemed as if he was paranoid and scared of someone or something. During his short stay at the second hotel, Lars also called his mother. In a hushed voice, 
He panically told her that four men were after him. His mother would later tell investigators that the fear in his voice was very real and no amount of consoling would calm him down. After a very restless night's sleep, Lars returned to Varna Airport on July 8, 2014 and visited the office of Dr. Kosta Kostov. Lars' hopes of returning home were dashed, however, when Dr. Kostov reiterated that given his condition, it would not be in his best interest to fly. But Lars decided to ignore this recommendation. He told the doctor that he was willing to accept responsibility for whatever happened to him. Just as the appointment was wrapping up, a construction worker entered the room. Varna Airport was undergoing a lot of construction and renovation work at the time, and it's likely that the construction worker had simply wandered into the wrong room. This situation was more of an annoyance than anything else, but for Lars, it freaked him out. His whole demeanor changed when the man entered the room, and he exclaimed, I don't want to die here. I need to get out of here. With that, Lars ran out of the door of the doctor's office, leaving behind his luggage and bags, and made a beeline for the entrance of the airport. This bizarre escape was captured on CCTV and became the most infamous piece of evidence we have in Lars' case. The CCTV footage shows Lars running, almost as if he's running for his life, through the airport, into the parking area, and then jumping over a fence and running near Highway A2. When Lars failed to return home and make contact with his family, he was reported missing and an investigation was opened. His friends were questioned and the CCTV footage was heavily reviewed. Lars had been exhibiting bizarre, paranoid behavior in the days leading up to his disappearance, and investigators began to wonder whether this paranoia was founded upon truth. As previously stated, Lars had gotten into an argument and been beaten up on July 6, 2014. Was someone really after him, or was it the head injury, possibly combined with the medication that he was prescribed, that induced this paranoia? The antibiotic Cefprozil is known to cause hallucinations and paranoia. His family said that he had never exhibited signs of mental illness before his trip, and when his friends boarded their flight home, they said he seemed happy and was in a good mood. Despite numerous investigations, the disappearance of Lars Mittank remains unsolved. His mother, Sandra, told Crime and Investigation, There's a good chance he'll come back. He just needs my help. Lars Mittank was last seen running out of the Varna Airport in Varna, Bulgaria, on July 8, 2014. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the BKA, which is the Federal Criminal Police Office in that country, at 49151-613-78673. Or as an alternative, you can contact the Varna Police directly at 359-52-611-516. Number 1. Dennis Shepard 46-year-old Dennis Shepard was described as an energetic and lively person who loved his girlfriend and his family. Dennis worked as a personal assistant in Port Washington, New York, and was doing well in his career and his private life. That was until a sudden onset of paranoia sent Dennis down a dark path. He became convinced that everyone he knew was working with the FBI to conspire against him. One day, Dennis's paranoia boiled over. Dennis was witnessed running door to door asking neighbors to call the United Nations because he wanted to report the conspiracy against him. Dennis told those who opened their doors that his family, neighbors, lawyers, and others in his life were involved in an FBI conspiracy to get him, and that he needed help. This alarmed neighbors who called the police, and Dennis was involuntarily taken into the Stony Brook University Hospital's psychiatric unit for observation and treatment. During his time in the hospital, Dennis was still convinced that there was an FBI conspiracy against him, and even believed that the officers who had taken him in and the staff who were treating him were in on the conspiracy, and that's why he had been taken in. In reality, Dennis had been taken in for his own safety and well-being, but his paranoia had grown too much and he was unable to make rational decisions. Dennis repeatedly told the staff at Stony Brook, I want to see how I do without medications, and that he would not be taking medications under any circumstances. He did not believe that anything was wrong, and the hospital was in the process of filing a court order to ensure that Dennis would have to take his medication and get the therapy and help he needed. On May 18th of 2012, Dennis was being transported to the Pilgrim Psychiatric Center for further treatment. He intended to fight the court order once he arrived at the psychiatric center, but he would never make it. According to staff who were traveling with Dennis that day, he simply jumped out of the car and ran off into the woods 
never to be seen again. Oddly enough, his disappearance was not reported by medical staff until several hours later, and the Suffolk County Police Department were extremely hesitant to get involved. It became clear that the Suffolk County Police Department did not take Dennis's disappearance seriously, despite the fact that he had been taken into psychiatric care and his notes stated that he was suffering from delusions and possibly schizophrenia. The Suffolk Police rested on the idea that Dennis had run away and was hiding from the police, although he had no real reason to do so. Disturbingly, no golden alert, which is for a missing vulnerable adult, was issued when Dennis disappeared, a fact that has greatly angered his family. These alerts have been proven to save lives and have been used in different iterations across countless states. Had a golden alert been issued, the outcome of Dennis' story may have been a lot different than the outcome I'm telling you now. The Pilgrim Psychiatric Center sits across from the Oak Brush Plains State Reserve, a sprawling park of over 813 acres. Is it possible that Dennis ran through the woods and made his way into this reserve? Since his disappearance, little progress has been made in this case, and his family has since filed a $5 million lawsuit against the Stony Brook Institution for allowing Dennis to escape. In March of 2021, a Reddit user named Always Sunny in Upstate made a post about Dennis's disappearance, and the post received an interesting comment. The commenter, who claimed to be Victoria Shepard, Dennis's sister, gave some further insight into her brother's case. She wrote, and I'm quoting here, This is Victoria Shepard. I am his sister. The police have been of no help at all. He is still missing. His dental records and our mom and another sister's DNA is on record. They did not even alert the police until several hours after he went missing. He was a limo driver and avid bike rider, so he knows Long Island very well. He lived in Nassau County when he went missing, and we lived in Suffolk for many years. He really could be anywhere, but we know no activity on bank accounts, credit cards, or social security number, so that makes us lose hope. Hopefully, one day he will be found. His family misses him terribly, especially his mom. She's been heartbroken since the day he went missing. End quote. Dennis Shepard was last seen running into the woods near the Pilgrim Psychiatric Center in Brentwood, New York, on May 18th of 2012. Dennis is described as a white male with blonde hair and blue eyes, stands about six feet tall, and weighed approximately 190 pounds. Dennis may be suffering from schizophrenia, and at the time of his disappearance, he was suffering from paranoid delusions. He was last seen wearing a black t-shirt, tan pants, and tan tennis shoes. Anyone with information is asked to contact Detective Steve Gargans of the Suffolk County Police Department at 631 852-6110 and reference case number 12-309-678. Well, friends, there you have it. What do you think of this half dozen strange cases where people disappeared after running into the woods? Very strange indeed. I look forward to your comments, but please be friendly and respectful. Many times the families of these victims do watch the videos and read the comments. So please, don't comment anything you would want to read if it was your family member or loved one being discussed. In the meanwhile, be good to yourselves and each other. Stay safe out there, and I'll see you just a little farther on down the trail. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time.